So this is joint work with my colleague in the Department of Statistics, Don Rubin. So first for the statisticians mostly, uh, there's a distinction here, not to get confused. Networks oftentimes are used as tools to explain dependence pattern in data. And so in this particular setting, you may have high dimensional vectors, yi, coming for, for example from a normal distribution, and then there's a link between the inverse variance covariance matrix and a graph, but in this particular case, um, the network is estimated from data and represent, represents dependence pattern. So in this talk, like in uh, Guido Imben's talks uh, earlier this morning, we're gonna have network data. And so my unit of analysis here, or unit of measurement is yij, uh, could be a binary um, variable, it could be just the number of emails person i sends to person j, and it's off, this type of data is often displayed as a network, okay? So network as data. Um, so since this is sort of a very inter interdisciplinary audience, um, I thought I'd have a slide to talk about statistical analysis of network data. And so um, it's been an area that's been emerging in statistics, and it's sort of now one of the core areas of statistical inquiry. And one of the questions people who may not be familiar with it very much uh, could be why is, is it not obvious, okay? And uh, so for a long time, for example, in physics, people were working on um, scale-free graphs or community detection. And you know, I wanted almost to title this slide beyond community detection and, uh, and scale-free graphs. And so from a statistical perspective, there's lots of work, for example, on time series and spatial data, which are other, you know, more uh, sort of slightly more complicated uh, outcome spaces, and so what's very different in statistical analysis of network data is that the notions of sample size and variability are different. So you may have one single network, and so the sample size is what, one, because you have one replication of the network, is n, because you have n people in the network, or somewhere in between. And so there's a paper on statistical science by Krivitsi and Skolacic that's very recent. It's the first paper that sort of makes some inroads into this question. The notion of variability is also different because if you have n uh, units but only one replicate for, and you're thinking about p-value as one of the statistical work, uh, work, so workhorses of statistics for better or worse, uh, typically p-values capture var variability due to replication and in this case we don't have replications again. So, you know, there's sort of some depth here uh, that's hidden. Um, in, in time series and spatial data where you have the direction of time on sort of well-defined direction of space, people have notions like uh, stationarity and ergodicity of a process, and essentially or intuitively what that notion does allows you to say, well, if you have one time series only, the variability along the time series is sort of equivalent to the variability at one point in time that you would observe with replicates, and so you can get around only observing one time series and still doing statistical inference. With network data, there's a combinatorial element that is sort of coming into play. There's not a well-defined direction, and so that complicates and makes extending this concept sort of difficult. There's other things. For example, the limiting regimes that are useful in application are not for a fixed network N, and you keep observing outcomes on this fixed network over time, is for a growing network. And so typically these regimes are not explored very well. Even if for in the few cases where these regimes are explored, are explored, as n grows, we have what people call a dense network limit, which means you know, the, the expected degree goes to infinity at some rate. And in reality, in applications, you have sparse networks. And so these regimes, again, that have been explored in, in the statistical literature no longer apply or are no longer useful uh, in applications to, to network data. And so there's a lot of depth here, and um, I, I'll, I'll mention one more, one more aspect of this which is relevant later. So when we do modeling of network data, oftentimes we work with equivalence classes of models so that are defined up to measure preserving transformations, and so we're gonna estimate one canonical element of that class. Um, and I wanna say that because throughout the talk I'm gonna sort of skip a lot of these details and talk about the network or the estimator and so on and so forth, but I wanted to mention it here because there's hidden depth throughout. This just would make it for a very boring presentation. So I'm just gonna keep to the ideas. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna give you sort of my 
recently favorite slice of this statistical network analysis that has to do with uh, designing randomized experiments and causal inference when you, when you have network data. And so uh, we'll see how that goes. So uh, first I'm gonna introduce this notion of network interference or of interference which Guido sort of touched upon earlier. So intuitively, intuitively there's a lot of situations where the outcome of interest, you think of, for example, just final grade on a particular class, depends on interventions that do not involve Joe directly. For example, um, some of the friends of Joe get private tutoring or you know, Joe's friends are doing well on average and so on and so forth, right? And so here in this sort of intuitive, illustrative example, the connections among the students drive the dependence between the outcome and the events or among the outcomes, okay? And so now to be a little bit more conceptual or formal, that's how people talk in general in the sciences about interference. So your outcome will depend on somebody else's outcome or on somebody else's treatment. But formally and statistically, there are very different, these are very different situations. And so here I just give a sample of them. For example, this morning, Guido talked about what we would call interference proper, where the outcome of Joe is a function of the treatment Z to Joe and a treatment of Joe's neighbors. Uh, in, in psychology, on economics, there's carryover effects and spillover effect. In, in epidemiology, there's mediation. These are often situations that can be described by saying that the outcome of Joe is a function of the treatment to Joe and, and the outcome of Joe's bodies. So in some sense, the, the outcome is mediate, you know, the, the intervention is mediated through some outcome. There's a more general set of problems that independently of how you really define this function, uh, all share this feature that they, there's a variance, covariance matrix among the outcome that is a function of a network that you have, that you have access to. And there's obviously an application, this combination of these, of these things. Um, and you know, the, one of the key sort of aspects of all these distinctions, or maybe orthogonal to all these distinctions, is whether or not you've, you have access to the network before you are gonna carry out the intervention, and what's the quality of the connections? Are, are they fixed and you believe them? Are they observed with error? Do they sort of align with the notion of interference, interference that you're trying to capture, that you're trying to capture, and so on and so forth? So for me, so how, how this sort of started, uh, started with an involvement in the Obama for America campaign and you know, with uh, some involvement with Google. So there the problems, the applied problems where you may find interferences, uh, you wanna try to get people who are pro-Obama to get out and vote. You have access to them through an application that runs on Facebook. You don't wanna spam everyone. And so you have to design a, an experiment that, you know, through which people will, will email privately or will send a note privately to a few of their friends to try and tell them to get out and vote. Um, in, in, at Google, when you try to design online auctions, it's a slightly different setting. The unit of analysis is no longer the person, is the, the unit of analysis is the auction, and, and there's an edge between two auctions if the same advertisers has been invited to bid in, in both in two auctions, okay? And there's a more recent, um, effort that we're ca carrying out with LinkedIn on labor economics, and there's many other applications where this sort of causal effect of interference uh, come to play. So why is this interesting? Well, from a statistical perspective, you know, I will argue it's the intellectual frontier because if you look through 50, 80 years of literature on causal inference, uh, people largely assume interference away. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, and and in, in a lot of the applications where interference uh, is, is sort of of interest, you know, this assumption is obviously no longer tenable. And from an applied perspective, at least in the few problems that I have worked on, um, people want to estimate the effect of interference to then leverage them and affect changes in the future. And so, you know, they, they are certainly interested in having a causal estimate, in estimating a causal effect, because they wanna use it and they, they think that's gonna change how people are gonna behave. And so here I'm gonna focus uh, on one particular situation where yi, the outcome is a function of zi, the intervention to the unit i, and z sub ni, which is the intervention on the neighbors of unit i. Uh, 
and I, I have a graph G available pre-intervention. And, um, and so we'll see where we go. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this area of causal inference if you're not familiar with, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of bring you to the point or contrast the classical setting with this new network setting and, and try to make, um, to highlight what is changing. So the fundamental object here that underlies causal inference is what people call the table on science. So here I have four units, two males, two females, and I have allocate, I can allocate treatment, give it a pill or not the pill. So the treatment is binary, an outcome might be binary or real valued, it doesn't matter. So what the table is describing here is all the possible treatment allocations to units. So I have four units, the treatment's binary, I have 16 possible allocations. And so the table of science is not this table of treatment allocation, is it is a table of the potential outcomes defined in all these possible 16 um, versions of the world, okay? And so the potential outcome for unit I, Y, I is a function of the entire allocation vector, N equals four, so four units, and you know, I is, I run over the units, and Z runs over the columns of this matrix, so that's pretty simple. Um, so classically, you know, in w what people assume when they do causal inference with potential outcome in the absence of interference, they assume that the outcome of unit I is just a function of the treatment to person I, okay? So now, if you think about the table of science, the relevant outcomes for unit I are no longer 16, are just two, right? You with the pill, you without the pill. So YI, ZI equals zero, and YI, ZI equals one. And the table of science simplifies to a four by two uh, sets of relevant outcomes. And then once you have this restricted table of science given your assumption, you just define inferential targets or causal inferential targets as a function of, this ta of the elements of this table. So for example, the, the effect of treatment on unit I could be defined as the difference YI Z1 minus y YI Z0, okay? So that's an individual um, causal effect. So now, that's not estimable, okay? And so estimable inferential targets are often defined as summaries over the units. And you know, one popular summary statistic is the average. So the popular, a popular example is the average treatment effect. And so here, denoted ATE is just an average over the units of these individual differences. That turns out to be estimable. Uh, in addition, there may be simple restrictions on the inferential target. There's two sort of classes of restrictions. One could be dictated by the scientific question of interest. For example, I'm interested in the average treatment effect for male freshmen at Harvard. This is a restriction on the units. Or it, it may be for statistical efficiency considerations. For example, I may be interested in the average treatment effect over, random, over allocations where I treat 50% of the units, okay? And I'm not, not gonna go deeply into that. There's a theory for why this is useful. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a different class of restrictions on the allocations. So now enters the network. So I have an, an observed network, and so how do I, you know, how do the, the, does the definition of potential outcomes change if I have interference? What do I really mean by interference, right? So here I have just three um, different assumptions one may make that capture interference in some way. So in the, in the top row here, the potential outcome of a unit I is a function always of, of the treatment to unit I and of the treatment allocation uh, to neighbors, okay? That's Z sub Ni is just a sub vector of allocation to units, and I'm being a little bit creative with notation, but I hope it's clear. Alternatively, you could say, well, the potential outcome of unit I is just a function of the treatment to unit I and the number of treated neighbors. Or again, differently, is a function of the outcome of unit I and the percentage of treated neighbors, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in each one of these situations, the table of science only partly simplifies, doesn't get back to, you know, the simple case of two columns. And the point is that now we have multiple allocation vector, multiple columns in that table I showed you before that remain relevant for each unit I. And what do I mean exactly by remain relevant? I mean that the set of distinct potential outcomes, YI of the vector Z for one unit, is now a function of aspects of the treatment allocation to neighbor to neighbors defined through this assumption, okay? So to be a little bit more formal, I introduce a new notion. I'm gonna distinguish now between treatment and exposure. Okay, so 
what, is, what does exposure mean? Well, you know, unit I is exposed if it has, for example, one or more treated neighbors. So everyone can be treated or not, but there's an additional concept, exposure, which means having neighbors treated. And so in, in, you know, if we follow a little bit this particular example, now unit I here at the center can be in four different states. I can be in control, treated, none of the neighbors are treated, could be treated, the unit receives treatment, none of the neighbors get treatment, could be exposed because the unit itself is not treated but some neighbors, more than one, are treated, or could be treated and exposed because both of these things happen, okay? And so in this particular example, the table of science simplifies to M units times four columns for units with at least one neighbor but not, it's not a, a rectangular M by four matrix because for the units who only have one connection I can, all, can only be treated or untreated. So it's always a rugged array. So this table of science and the table of potential outcomes becomes more complicated, okay? So that's part of the complications going in. I'm gonna use it also, uh, I mean, could introduce two more concepts. I'm gonna talk about egos and alters. So now units could be egos or units could be alters. So given a notion of exposure, for example, you're exposed if at least one of your friends is treated and given some inferential target that captured this notion of exposure, and we'll talk about the formulas later, okay? Now, for any given treatment allocation vector, some units will be relevant to the inferential targets and some will be irrelevant. And so it's sort of the opposite of what I was saying here. Here I was saying the perspectives on the units should look through rows of that Y matrix. Here I was saying for every unit, there's multiple potential outcomes now. Multiple Zs are relevant. And here I'm saying now, if I look at one column for one given Z on the rows of that matrix, some, some units are relevant to the inferential target and some will not be. And I'm gonna call the units that are relevant egos and all the rest alters, okay? And so here I have a simple network. Now all of these are different units and I'm just picking a few units and this one is, in, in con this is exposed, this is controlled, this is treated, this is treated and exposed according to the definition in the example before, right? But some of these are non, okay, if, if, if my, let's say, inferential target is the effect of exposure, okay, and here there's a definition of effect of exposure, yi exposed given a particular allocation vector, minus y in control given a particular allocation vector, what happens is now the blue units and the purple units are not relevant, so those will be alters, okay? So that's sort of what I'm saying. So now with these notions, of treatment and exposure, the notion of egos and alters, we can go back to the definition of the inferential target, which, which is my goal, and, and we can think about the, the definition of inferential targets again. And so now, estimable inferential targets have to be defined as summaries, as before, over the units, the egos in particular, but also over allocations, okay? And so I'm gonna give you this example, I'm gonna tell you then why. So here in the example, I'm gonna define exposure as, be, as, as before as having at least one treated neighbor. The average interference effect for this definition of interference, right, is gonna be an average over the units as before, in particular over the egos, right, for exposed given Z minus control given Z. So for every particular location, I'm gonna look through the units, find the exposed ones, look at their outcome, find, I'm gonna find the control ones look at the outcome, take the difference, but then I have to average over Z or at least take a summary over Z and the reason is sort of obvious is if you now have a different inferential target for every version of the world, that's not very useful. You have to have a summary of that distribution, right, as your inferential target because it's gonna be well defined and so typically, you know, average could be one, median could be another and so on and so forth, okay? But so the point here is that now you have the estimable inferential target also be an average or a summary over allocations. That didn't happen before. And now we can ask, okay, so what is the role of the network G, okay? And so before, if you remember, we had two classes of restrictions, one due to the science and one due to some optimality concept. Now here we have an additional new set of combinatorial restriction due to the graph, that need to be imposed for efficiency, okay? And so the questions to ask in this particular effort here would be what features of the graph do these restrictions depend on, right? 
maybe they depend on the degree. Maybe they depend on the average degree. Maybe they depend on the maximum degree. And then, you know, if you can identify some of these features that are sort of useful for different classes of problems, then the question is how to randomize efficiently and how to estimate, okay? And so on and so forth. So there's a whole talk I could give you about this type of problems, but instead I'm just gonna move on. So this part of the talk was about essentially contrasting the classical setup and the classical inferential targets with the new setup and the new inferential targets and what's new and what's difficult and what kind of complications come into play. So now we're gonna really skip forward and talk about optimal design, okay? And so here, my optimal design approach is gonna be in two stages, but before getting there, within the large statistical literature, there are two approaches to, to optimal design. One, which is sort of typical in the industrial engineering uh, literature, think of 3D printing, that's a good example. So you have to run a 3D printing machine, you don't want you know, deformation and so on and so forth. You have to find one optimal set of parameters, one optimal set of knobs at which you wanna run your machine. And that's optimal design a la Kiefer, I would say, or you know, there's a literature on that. And in social sciences, which is what we are interested in here in this talk in particular, there's a different notion of optimality. Instead of having one optimal set of knobs, you want to find an optimal collection of treatment allocations, okay, because you want to randomize. We want to pick one of them at er random, okay? And so this is the fisher kempthorne approach, and it's relevant to social sciences, and the idea is that, um, you know, it, it protects you from, uh, under some conditions, obviously, on some unobserved confounders and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna have to find, to define an optimal collection of treatment allocations. So we're gonna do that in two stages. First, we have a network model available for intervention. We're gonna summarize that model, oh, sorry, we're gonna summarize that network with the network model, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then that particular network model is simple enough that will allow us, will allow us to, to do some analytical calculation and then using these analytical formulas, we'll be able to do some, we define some class of optimal treatment allocation strategies, okay? So now I'm gonna do a slight detour, a little bit of background into modeling network heterogeneity. So the class of models we'll be, we'll be using, or the basic sort of model we'll be using, is a block model. So here you can think of network data, that's what you see. You don't see the colors, you just see network data. Here, just for simplicity, I showed you there's some red nodes, some blue nodes, and some green nodes, and they behave similarly, okay? So there's a notion called structural equivalence, and what these nodes are, they are structurally equivalent. And uh, this block model is trying to find sets of nodes that behave similarly, okay? Or they are structurally equivalent. The model is parameterized into, in terms of two sets of parameters. One is called the block model, is the group-to-group -group or block-to-block -block connectivity matrix. And the entry here is the, the probability that a, a person or a node in, in group A will connect to another person in group A, and so on and so forth. And you know, this, just by looking at this particular instance of a block model, we can, we, can, we can comment this is not community detection, this is not maximizing modularity, because in this particular case, there's no connection between the green nodes, they are still structurally equivalent, and so here this uh, you know, CC sort of element of the block matrix is zero, if you were to maximize modularity, that's not an answer that you would find, okay? So it's slightly different than, than community detection. Uh, it is really looking for this notion of structural equivalence. Then on top of this block model matrix, you're gonna need a map, which is N by three in my case, because I have N nodes and three groups, that tells you which nodes belong to which group, okay? So that's that. And it turns out that this particular very simple example is just one example of a, of a more general class of exchangeable, cross mod, uh, exchangeable graph models, uh, which is an interesting, you know, th there's an interesting literature about this type of models which sort of marries probability, combinatorics, and statistics. And so we're gonna talk about this a little more. And this slide is just sort of saying, well, there's two real, two approaches to, to network analysis. One is Exchangeable graph models, that's what we're gonna do. One is exponential random graph models. Please, if you're new to this area or you're trying to enter into this area, don't really work on these models. They're not very useful. Okay, so that's my, my spiel. Um, so what are these exchangeable graph models? 
the object that defines an exchangeable graph model is called a graphon, is a function that lives on the unit square, maps to the unit interval. And we're going to use this function called the graphon or the graph kernel to generate uh, network data. Okay? And so if you wanted to generate a network <coughs> of size n from this constant one half graphon, what you would do, you would just pick a uniform number, random number between 0 and 1 for each of the nodes. You have n nodes, so you pick one uniform random numbers. Then evaluate for all these pairs, u i, u j, the probability of a connection given u i, u j. That's what this function is for, and call that w i, j. And then just sample a Bernoulli with that probability. Okay? So in this particular case, I have an erdos Reni with probability 1 half. Here I have a block model. Here I have uh, an approximation to a scale-free network, and here I have just a more flexible uh, network that's due to this graph one. Okay, so these are some examples. Um, so what uh, what we're going to do? We're going to take the network that we observe pre-intervention, and we are going to find the consistent estimate. We we're we're going to posit that this network is going to come from a graph one. We're going to find a piecewise constant approximation of this graphon, okay? So this is what the stochastic block model approximation is for. Leverages the idea or, you know, the parameterization of a block model. It's slightly more nuanced because now there's a number of blocks and so on and so forth, and there's a permutation business to deal with. But essentially, that's what it does. It's a stochastic block model approximation of this graphon that, define an ex that defines an exchangeable graph model. Now, there's a lot of estimators out there. Most of them are two-stage estimators. And this, oops, this, is how, this is how they work. In the first stage, they take the observe network matrix G, and they commit to a permutation by sorting, clustering, matching. There's different estimators have different ways that work well under different assumptions to sort of commit to a permutation. This is the permuted matrix. Once you get the permuted matrix, you can, you know, you can imagine embedding this into the unit interval, and then what you do, you're just going to do a histogram, a simple histogram estimate of, of, um, of the graphon from the permuted matrix. Some estimators have three stages. There's a smoothing step, or total variation minimization, and so on and so forth, applied on this, on this matrix. We'll stop here. We'll just consider piecewise constant approximation. That's what the stochastic block model approximation is for. It's good because, <clears throat> well, I'll say, I'll say more later why it's good, but that's what we're going to do. So now here is, you know, maybe one good point to mention some issues or some, some of the depth I alluded to before. So in practice, you know, how are you going to estimate this? You're going you're gonna to randomize an experiment. You're going to define a randomized experiment or estimate the graph on using one large sample or two small replicates. No, they are unlabeled. Okay, then how, how do you get data? Um, is your data labeled? Well, the data could be like the, the Facebook social graph. Okay. So they are, they, are, they, are, they are labeled, meaning that you have some covariates, I have some information about the nodes. But you don't know how they associate with the nodes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't understand what you mean by parameterization. Well, you know, so I was talking about before. <coughs> If I give you an adjacency matrix for a graph, if you permute the, the rows and columns, right, you're still going to get the same object in some sense, right? And so here I'm trying to estimate a canonical graph on which is one particular element, one particular element of this equivalence class of of models, because that object here is defined up to up to a measure preserving transformation. And so, in that sense, this is what the permutation is trying to do, is try to identify one canonical element of the family. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so here are some issues, okay, and some are very practical, some are very uh, methodological. So, if you're working with sparse graphons, for example, one classic, one, one way people do uh, defines sparse graphons is by defining wij like before and then having this sparsifying constant which is a function of n like 1 over n, 1, one square root over n. But that's not very useful if you're trying to find results for finite n. Okay. And so 
the other issue is, well, what kind of norm, how are you going to measure how well your approximation approximates the actual graph on? Well, the Katmut norm, it would be the natural norm, but you get abysmal convergence rates. L2 is better, and in practice, the question is, what does the cut norm buy you? And so on and so forth. The theory, again, is for an infinitely exchangeable graph. There's finite nodes in practice, so there's a finite exchangeability issues. We have a paper on sharp, sharp total variation bounds um, between finitely exchangeable and infinitely exchangeable um, network models. As I mentioned before, there are multi-stage strategies available before. We're just going to focus on these two-stage strategies for the time being. And I'm going to point you to papers later where a lot of this is um, explained in depth. What I'm going to show you here instead, I'm just going to show you some comparative performance analysis of what happens if you take two graphons, one here and one here, and you apply different estimators that exist out there to estimate them. So here on the second column, I have the stochastic block model approximation. It's recognizable. It's a piecewise contest approximation. There's a um, mean square error associated with it, order 10 to the minus 4. This is the universal singular value thresholding by Shurav Chatterjee at Stanford, which is not particularly designed for network, but it works for just any um, n by p matrix. But you know it can be applied here. This is sort of the approximation it gives you. It works well for you know low complexity or low rank networks. And this is a, the total variation minimization estimator I, I, I alluded to before, where you take uh, the piecewise constant approximation and you do an additional smoothing step. And so we, you know, while this sort of approximation may be slightly better in terms of MSC, the reason why in this particular application on, on design of experiments, we, we sort of stick to this stochastic block model approximation is because it's a piecewise constant approximation, reduces dimensionality, and leads to analytical insights. Okay, so here, just to give you a flavor, I took three matrices for the Nutella P2P network, three consecutive days. I fit my stochastic block model approximation. I compare it to some uh, other network. In, you know, these networks over here have completely different n over different days. This also has a different number of nodes. It's a completely different network. And you know, when you look at the estimates of the canonical graphon, you know, they sort of in, suggest that you may actually use this stochastic block model approximation, for instance, to do hypothesis testing. You know, it captures something at the, at the level of granularity that is both intuitive and, and analytically useful. Okay? What I mean by the fact that you can, you can get analytical insights, and I think this is a good point and a, and a very useful point, is that there's a whole um, field of study uh, in, in uh, theoretical computer science where people have difficult tasks to, to, to carry out on arbitrary networks. And the typical uh, approach is to compute approximate answers on the exact network. Okay? And what this sort of block model approximation instead suggests is that given that it's a very simple object you get out of the estimation step, you can perform exact calculation on this piecewise constant object on the approximation of the network. And so you know, if you are in a situation where the network is what it is and you cannot deviate from it and it's really the truth and there's no error, maybe you need to have this more computer science approach if you are in a situation where the network may be observed with error or you know, there's some incomplete information and so on and so forth, maybe this is exactly what you need. And this is exactly what we need in, in the randomized experiment sort of, sort of uh, application. So let's just move on. So we are going to do this optimal design in two strategies, as I said before. First, we're going to summarize the observed network with a stochastic block model approximation, assuming the network comes from an exchangeable graph model. And now we're going to find a class of optimal treatment allocations <coughs> using this approximation. Okay? So there, there are some assumptions, not all of them, but you know, the main assumption. So I'm assuming interference proper, like before. So the outcome is a function of zi and the neighbors the allocation to neighbors. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that my network data G comes from this exchangeable graph model. And then I'm additionally further constrain myself by saying, OK, I'm going to assume that the outcomes uh, are additive in, um, in the 
treatment effect and in the exposure effect. And so that will lead to a linear model as follows. And here, this function f could be the number of neighbors treated on, or the percentage of neighbor treated. It doesn't matter for this particular theory to apply. And so I'm just going to um, you know, denote it more generically, like f sub i is a function of the particular location and, and the graph. And I'm going to give particular examples later on. Okay. So here's the optimal design procedure. So first, I'm going to map the restricted inferential target. That's sort of you know, what we talked about before, where the restrictions are due to different reasons, the graph, the science, statistical efficiency purposes, to the parameters of my model. Okay, so now I have that the average treatment effect is going to be a function of the graph and beta, and the average exposure or interference effect is going to be a function of g and gamma. And at this stage, I don't need to do any approximation unless you really want to. Okay, here you can plug in just the graph that you have. The second step is to estimate the stochastic block model, okay, using the data, and so then you get this approximation, which is just a set of parameters. One set of parameters is going to be the map of units to blocks, and the other is the block-to-block -block network matrix, like, like we had before. Now, with this set of parameters, you can find analytical expressions with different levels of um, approximations for this quantity, okay? So, given what? Given a, a, an allocation strategy that gives you the, vari the, the flexibility to either treat a particular number of people in each block or a particular percentage of people in each block. Okay, so here P is a vector that has as many dimensions as I have blocks, and each of the elements specify the percentage of people I'm going to treat in each block, and I want to find the optimal set of percentages, okay? And it turns out that I can do that very, very easily by minimizing, for example, the variance of the estimates of these quantities if I have analytical expressions for this, for this formula, okay? And so, again, I'm going to skip some details here. I'm going to show you some comparative performance analysis of, of how that turns out to be. So here I have a budget on the percentage of number treated. Okay. So it could be half the people get treated, half the people don't get treated, or P. Okay. So here I treat 50% of the people. So one of the competing strategies would be completely random assignment with P equals one half. So this is the Bernoulli allocation. Another, another strategy would be block randomizations using the stochastic block models as, as clusters. And so I pick a block at random, and then I treat all of the units in the block subject to this budget of how many people I can treat. Then I have a suboptimal and an optimal allocation strategy. In the suboptimal allocation strategy, the asymptotic expression for these objects, the number of people treated in a neighborhood, or the percentage of people treated in a neighborhood, assumes that all the units in the block have the same number of neighbors, which is suboptimal, or I can actually account for the variability in the number of neighbors of units within a block, okay? Because the block matrix, if you remember, only gives the average, it only gives the probability or the expected number of connections, but there's, there's a distribution there, right? So here is just one illustration of you know, qualitative, quantitative results. So here I'm, have, I'm setting the 80 to $10 is a simple, uh, online advertising example, which I won't get into. Uh, the average interference effect is $3, and the standard error I'm reporting here is a standard error over the randomizations. Okay, because that's what we really care about. And so here you can see that um, the, the target here is 3. There's some bias involved. What actually is important to notice is the randomization. So with complete random assignment, you get sort of 5 as, as the standard error. With um, cluster randomized assignment, you get 0.7. This is what people do in practice, for example, at LinkedIn uh, and in, on Facebook. And then if you just work a little bit harder and you use this stochastic block model approximation, you try to optimize these percentages, you, you can still cut the standard deviation in half. Okay? And I'll make a point later, this is very, very important for what things you can say about the effects in social science. So a couple of remarks. So the optimal strategy treats, like I mentioned, a, a distinct percentage of units in each block. And you can decide this percentage. That's what the optimal game is on. And the target is the estimated, uh, the, the, the standard deviation of, of the estimate, of the estimator. 
Uh, and then, you know, what's happening in this, in this black box intuitively? Well, together with the block model, the optimal strategy, P optimal, let's call it, okay, for this particular example, induces a multimodal distribution for the percent of neighbors treated. And, you know, these are sort of preliminary results, so I don't have analytical insights why, into why the multimodal distribution is what's giving me this substantial reduction in, in standard deviation, but still, that's, that's what's happening. And so this is just a picture. This is the random assignment. This is class randomized assignment, suboptimal and optimal. On the x-axis is the percent of neighbors treated. It's just the histogram, so the frequency on the y-axis. And so I'm going to have one more slide. I, I think so far we have talked about estimating the average interference effect. And so that's of interest to companies like Google, to companies like LinkedIn, uh, and Facebook, and so on and so forth. More generally, what people, or even, even more sort of widespread, what people do, they try to estimate the average treatment effect. And so there's a substantial literature where the claim, which is never validated, is that if, you, if you're estimating the average treatment effect, you can sort of ignore interference if you do, if you do randomization, just the same way that randomization protects you from unobserved confounders. Okay, and so here with uh, Vishesh Karva, there's a postdoc in the statistics department, we just did some calculations and these are preliminary results, partly satisfying, partly unsatisfying, but they just wanna tell you what's happening here. So the additivity, so we assume additivity of treatment and exposure effects like before. This analysis is for a completely randomized assignment with NT and NC, so you can decide, yeah, I think I'm 41 minutes. Um, so NT is the number of people treated, and C is the number of people controlled. And then we are looking at the naive estimator for the average treatment effect, which is just the average outcome for the people treated minus the average outcome for the people in control. And so, and this is just the formula for the bias, okay? And what this is telling you is that beta is actually the average treatment effect you're trying to estimate. Gamma is the amount, the, the, the interference effect. And so there's two qualitative results you can get out of there first there's always a negative bias. And this happens because if there's interference, you're gonna overestimate this part of the, of the formula. You're overestimate the outcome of people under control because they have been exposed, even if not directly treated, okay? The other qualitative sort of results you get is that, well, M is the number of edges, N squared is the number of nodes, so if you have a very large network and you're very sparse, maybe the interference effect goes away. It's partly unsatisfying because it doesn't depend on, on NC and NT, okay? So you can imagine that if I treat everyone, even if I have a small interference effect and a sparse network, that should matter, okay? So I'm just gonna conclude. So I guess the main points I wanna make here is that this is a conference on, on big data. Big data cannot really overcome poor experimental design choices or poor analysis especially in social sciences where, where what we want, we wanna target many effects, but these effects are small. And so getting sharp standard deviation is very important. And that's where design and analysis, statistical analysis and experimental design sort of buy you some, some points. Um, then, you know, what I showed you here is mostly optimal design in two stages for the average interference effect. And you know, I show you how estimating the average treatment effect under interference does require some care, okay? And I just wanna end here by thanking, you know, Don Ruby, my colleague, and Vishesh Karva, who I presented the result uh, from, from one joint paper with him, and then a, a number of students and postdocs who are working uh